Um, I'm Rosie Steinig. I work for Red Tomato. I'm a supply chain associate, which means I work on the trade team. Uh, a little bit about Red Tomato. We are a 20-year-old uh, food hub, so been around a little while. I have not been there for the full 20 years. Um, we work with a network of about 40 growers throughout the Northeast, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, New England. Not Rhode Island right now, but uh, we'll get there. Uh, we have a staff of uh, nine people. We do, let's see, last year we did about $5.3 million in sales, so uh, doing a lot, a lot going on. Um, in addition to trade, we also manage, uh, along with the IPM Institute of America, the Eco Apple program and the Eco Stone Fruit program. So this is uh, a growing protocol. If growers are interested, we will do the marketing and sales. But if not, it's just a, it's a, a way to grow uh, kind of the best apples, the best peaches that you can in New England. It's really hard to grow organic up there at wholesale volume. Um, our vision is for mid-sized farms to be the primary suppliers. So we're working with farms generally who already have a packing house, can do a standard pack, um, kind of have gone, uh, they're not doing direct uh, sales to their customers, not really CSA, a little bit, bi much bigger than that, but also for New England, big farm is very different than a big farm somewhere else in the country. Um, we are a nonprofit. We do have an LFPP uh, grant right now that we're doing for a crosstalk program. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so, kind of getting into the, the pieces of how do you actually make this work? Uh, we have a PACA license. We are legally required to have that. It means that we are a trader of produce, even though we don't have any assets. We don't have a warehouse, we don't have trucks. All of that is contracted out, but we are a produce distributor. Um, we have an insurance policy. We take ownership of the product, so that increases the market access for someone who can't get a larger uh, insurance policy, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, our aggregation distribution partnerships. And then working with many farms, since we don't see the product, these farms need to be able to have a standard pack, um, have the same quality across you know, 10 different farms. We're working in product lines. Um, and then we do marketing, sales uh, for the Eco Apple, Eco Stone Fruit. And then we have a dedicated staff to do sales. I spend so much time just on the phone, on email, taking orders, buying from growers, um, figuring out the trucking. I'm, I'm at a desk all day. It's, yeah. Um, so this kind of the point of this is that the rules and regulations that I'm dealing with, or you know, we are all dealing with, are not just for food safety. I know FISMA's the new thing right now, and it's scary, and no one knows quite what's going on or trying to figure out the pieces of it. Uh, there's a lot more that just to get even your foot in the door. Um, and then there's more to food safety than FISMA. It's, it, it's the newest thing, but it's been going on for a while, and there's so many different levels of it. Um, the first thing, this was uh, a surprise to me when I first started. So much of what's going on is completely voluntary. Buyer requirements, they're mostly voluntary. Um, compliance, though, is not voluntary. That's a legal term. It is, you know, there's, if you have to be compliant with FISMA, that's, uh, being compliant, with, it means that you can't not be compliant. It's illegal not to be compliant, whereas other things are different. Um, and a lot of these rules and regulations are for market access or for getting your foot in the door. Um, these buyer requirements can include insurance. They can include a third party, second party um, audit. Uh, some, I'll get more into that. And then there's growing practices, which are you know, certified organic or IPM. Or um, organic comes up a lot because it's the one that has a certificate associated with it. It's highly regulated. But how much time do you have to explain all these different things to your buyers? So, this is really, really sim oversimplified, but this is based on our experience at Red Tomato. There's three things that our buyers want. And our buyers, I would say, are produce managers, sometimes corporate level offices, um, we're or like uh, for Whole Foods, it's global. Um, but then also, we have to think about who their customers are. So who are we selling to? Well, we're selling to their customers. We're also selling to the person buying it on the other end of the phone, the distributors. Um, and they want cheap food. They want it to be easy to get, and they want it to be safe. 
but they won't actually tell us what all of those things mean. We kind of have to guess sometimes. So, <coughs> cheap food. This is how you get your foot in the door. Um, I hate to say it, but you can have the best tomato. We love red tomatoes or red tomato. It can be so good. We can know that it's the best thing. I can know the entire life story of the person growing it. But if it's not priced competitively, no one's going to buy it. It's really going to be difficult to get uh, started. Increasingly, we're seeing, at least in the Northeast, so I don't want to speak for everyone, that the premium paid for certified organic produce is really, it's not there like it used to be. Um, and local is increasingly getting put into this category of um, customers want to see it, be it in the grocery store, in the cafeteria, in the, you know, the distributor has to offer it. Because of that high demand, they're just trying to get it in there. So they'll do anything. So if anyone has a lower price, they're going to take it because they want that marketing tool. Um, and then always the fun, well, if it's, if it's local, why isn't it cheaper? It should be closer. Well, as, um, as Michelle was saying, it, if you can't fill up a 53-foot truck, it's going to be more expensive no matter what. When you're trying to compete with someone who has a 53-foot full truck every single time, it, the economics of it just don't work. Um, here's some fun examples from Red Tomato. So, um, you know, these aren't necessarily rules and regulations in that they are strict that someone, you know, but this is the kind of the rules that we have to create for ourselves in order to compete in the market. So, the first one, the cost of transportation. Uh, last mile delivery is our DSD program. That's what I manage at Red Tomato. So this is getting, uh, we, usually, we work with many different distributors doing their last mile, the much smaller trucks, and we're piggybacking off of these because if they're making money, they'll move anything. As long as everyone's making money, you can get stuff on a truck, even if they're already selling to the same customers, um, just run-of-the-mill conventional things. Um, so this has been a fun new thing where we have a customer who wants direct delivery, but they've also set their own local pricing. This is a Hannaford, which is a regional grocery store chain in New England. And so now my job is to make sure that um, all of this information that's on here is on the invoice that gets to their loading dock. Um, so when I sell them that beautiful red tomato, I have to have the PLU on there. Ah, I have to have this PLU, I have to have this name, I have to have the unit pricing, but I don't know about you guys, I sell my produce by the case, not by the unit. So then I'm on the phone with our software company saying, hey, how can I get all this information on here in addition to just doing basic sales? Um, and then, so this is a, an example of retail, but then if you get into institutional, uh, we did a request for proposals for a... Uh, an, uh, it's the Massachusetts Area Planning Council was trying to get more local um, into public schools using federal dollars. It's tight. You have to do a, uh, an RFP. You have to bid on everything. We've done this for two years. It was due two weeks before school started, and it included non-local products because you can't grow bananas in New England, but we're up against people um, who are able to offer both bananas and say that they can do local produce into the schools. Uh, include non-price proposal and a price proposal, so saying how we're going to get it to them. There are 10 school districts. I don't know how, we, even if we owned our own trucks, there's no way that we could get to every single school in a school district Tuesday mornings between 7 and 8 a.m. Not really possible, but apparently someone else can. Um, next one. Easy to buy, easy to use. So, the crash course in RFPs. Turns out nutritional guidelines are a big part of that. So I can offer a peach, but if I can't get them the right size peach to fit the nutritional standards, it's not going to get in the door. The, and so, um, with institutional as well, and this, oh, the details of this are fun. You have a food service management company. You have the um, you have their contract with whichever institution. So say Northeastern University, they're through Chartwell's. Chartwell's food buying group is called Food Buy. And then within that, there are contracts to different vendors. So we have started, um, we are a Food Buy approved vendor, but that doesn't mean that we're compliant with their food distribution. So we're still coming in around that. 
um, which really limits how much they can buy from us. And then retail. We don't always know what we're up against uh, in the warehouse. You know, we can have the standardized pack. I can know that it's, they want a 88 count apple, but if I don't know the price or if, I, if they're getting in a different pack into the stores or something, I have to constantly ask that for that information to make sure that we can stay in there because we're, we're not a big distributor. Um, and then there's that, you know, it's, it's almost always gonna be easier for a produce manager a chef, anyone to buy through their distributor. But uh, sometimes doing DSD is the way to get into that. Uh, so we try and think of our DSD program as a step from direct to the school, direct to the um, institution, as a way to say, look, you like this product, we can get it to you consistently. Let's try and work with the distribu distributor on this. Um, and that'll make it easier for them because it'll be in their order guide. It'll be faster for them to get it. Um, so examples of this. We have online ordering. No one really likes to use it because they just, it's still not the system that exists for them. Um, wrapped cauliflower is one of my favorites. We sell a nine count, beautiful cauliflower, leaf wrapped. We know that that packet is competitive with different distributors. I go to you know, a grocery store, we only buy wrapped cauliflower. Uh, all right, well, I've got to find another customer because that's a lot of time, that's a lot of packaging, and that's just, you know, you, got, you have to pick your battles on what you're going to do. Um, and then lightly processed is another one that comes up a lot, uh, that cut carrot stick, those, you know, the, stir, the diced pepper onion mix, all those things that people are really used to seeing in the institutional kitchens that make it a lot faster. That takes a lot of time, and there's totally different regulations around that, which I'll get to. Um, and then this also goes for the grab and go. Everyone wants, you know, those three apples in that nice bag that's got, you know, the label on it and all of that. That takes a lot of time, but if that's what gets in the door, we do offer a grab and go bag of cherry tomatoes because that's what people want. Um, so the, the last one is where we get into I mean, no one will admit it, but it, it happens. All, food waste happens, and I, it's frustrating. Um, insurance. You are not required legally necessarily to have insurance to start selling produce. However, it's a good business practice to have it. And there's different minimums, different policies. Um, and really, you have to base it off of what your buyer's requirement is. Even if every buyer has a different one, you have to figure out what fits the most number of them. Voluntary food safety audits. Um, in Massachusetts, we have uh, the CQP program, which is a few years old, and it is a state-run um, food safety certification. They've done a lot of work to try and explain to buyers, grocery store, all of that, what this is and what it's equivalent to. Um, USD gap, harmonized gap. These are ones that um, you can get through the Department of Ag in Massachusetts. And then you've got your bigger ones, the GFSI, global gap. Um, these are the ones that usually the larger distributors, they're going to work with growers who have this. Uh, and then there's FISMA, which is freaking everyone out. For example, uh, within, so step back to insurance. These are three different examples. Food service distributor, so like a uh, performance food group. This was actually RLB. A week before corn is ready, they said we need a $10, um, insurance, $10 million insurance minimum. Well, red tomato, we were, we were able to figure that out, but now we're not selling to them anymore because we couldn't keep that up. Um, then you've got the food service management company. They must have themselves listed as an additionally insured, so I have to go back to the insurance company and get them added on. Well, that, that takes like two weeks, so now I'm two weeks behind trying to sell to them because they only told us this when I sent the purchase order, or the sales order. But then, the regional grocery store only wants $1 million, which is actually totally doable. So we you know, have to figure out, okay, what's gonna, this is just a lot of time. Um, and to figure out this information, it's a lot more helpful to do, take care of this kind of stuff in the winter time when you're not in the midst of trying to do everything else. And then food safety, 
Um, the new thing with FSMA is that everyone's asking for an audit report along with their food safety certification. Historically, Red Tomato, up until last year, really didn't keep these audit reports on file. We know the growers. We know what's going on. The certificate's supposed to stand for something. You wouldn't get it if you weren't supposed to get it. But now everyone's asking for the audit report, assuming that if something were to be, uh, if there were a food safety outbreak or something had gone wrong, that somehow having this report on file would protect them. However, USDA GAP is um, not actually fully FSMA compliant. You, you need more to happen than just what USDA GAP requires. Um, and then, my favorite one, I can't tell you who this customer is, unfortunately, because of a contract. Um, they, they have, in their food safety, their own food safety uh, program, told us that we must have 60 random portions tested from each block on file in case they ask for it. They didn't actually tell us what they wanted it tested for, um, but we just, we have to be ready for whenever they ask for it. And we also can't get anyone on the phone to explain to us why or um, what food safety audit we should be getting that would cover this. They don't have an answer for that either. Uh, but, you know, maybe FISMA will help, huh? So, FISMA, I would say, there's so much going on. There's eight foundational rules, but the three to really pay attention to um, is the produce safety rule, uh, the preventative controls rule, and the transportation. And the produce safety rule, I'm sure everyone's having fun with the uh, PSA trainings. I went, to my, I went to one last week, and I, I learned some stuff. Um, and so I would say, just for everyone, it's, who's implementing this in your state? I know Massachusetts, it's the Department of Agriculture. In Rhode Island, it was the Department of Health, and then it became the Department of uh, Environmental Management. And just to know who to ask, because the whole idea of this is supposed to be education through regulation, or maybe the other way around, but you need to know who to ask, um, and maybe before the FDA shows up at your door. Uh, and the thing that I think scares a lot of people, and especially buyers about this, is there's no checklist, there's no certificate. There's not supposed to be. So a farm can say that they're compliant, but I don't, there's, there's no paper trail. Um, preventative controls is important for anything that's processed. So that cut and go, that, gra that, that you know, cut carrot stick that's gonna be what gets you into a school, that's, you have to have a commercial kitchen, it has the Department of Health, and so the preventative controls covers that stuff if you want to get into anything processed. And then as a food hub, um, especially a food hub that does not see the trucks going out all the time, we don't see um, the loading docks always, is this transportation rule. And I have asked someone from the USDA, from the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, private consultant, and no one can quite tell me um, what's next on this. A lot has been put into figuring out the produce safety rule implementation, and the best answer I've gotten is we're just not there yet. But if things are moving on trucks, you can ask for a HACCP plan, you can ask for whatever, but there isn't anything that's required to have on file. It's just you have to know which questions to ask of any trucking partner um, and, and kind of hope for the best right now. Uh, and then these are a couple of other questions I get. A lot of time, isn't local organic? No, that's, especially with the eco apple, that's a fun one. Um, ugly produce, a favorite one. Um, no one wants to grow ugly produce. That's not, you know, we're trying for. Is your business sustainable? I don't know what that means because that could cover everything from growing practices, labor, um, you know, our finances. It's, uh, okay, and then who's harvesting? Um, increasingly, a lot of people are really interested in the labor behind the food. Uh, that, and so one thing Red Tomato has been doing, um, we've been kind of trying to work with our partners in documenting, and we've put together a separate website following our food through the, food for, through the Red Tomato food chain um, and to highlight who, you know, the different practices that each farm uses. Um, in Red Tomato, uh, in New England, a lot of uh, apple growers use H2A labor, and sometimes it's like the same five guys that have been coming for 25 years. Um, but customers don't always know that. Buyers don't always know that. So to try and tell that story. 
Uh, one thing, and so Red Tomato, historically, we stay out of labor on farms. It's not what we do. We do marketing. We do sales. Um, however, one thing that we have been trying out, we started this, um, this 2017 was the first year of a multi-year pilot working with two farms um, in the Red Tomato Network. Uh, EFI was started through partnership with United Farm Workers, um, and biggest partners signed on to start were Costco, Whole Foods, and Bon Appetit. And the idea is farm worker training. If you have an activated workforce that, you know, they have the, they're allowed to organize, they have um, benefits, they're able to organize themselves and communicate with the people who own the farms, you're going to have a better product. And so the idea is that if a farm gets this certification, there's a premium, Costco, Whole Foods, and Bon Appetit say they're willing to pay it for this product, and then that money goes back into the farm. But also, that their communication is happening, so if there is a food safety issue, it's the, it's the farm labor who's the, the front line on that. Um, and they're able to have communication all the way through. This is really hard to quantify. It's very qualitative, but maybe a certificate will prove that this is really doing something. And uh, in New England, it's actually been really hard. This is a program that started um, with much, much larger farms than in New England, California, Mexico, um, Nature Sweet Tomatoes, I think, is one that we see a lot in grocery stores. So we've been actually working on scaling this down. And how do you do this on a farm that doesn't have year-round labor? or a farm that um, doesn't have the money to do a third-party audit. They can be thousands of dollars. Um, and so we've been getting a lot of feedback on how to make this viable and scalable for farms that are small, you know, that have those same five guys coming, or enormous all the way across. Um, and that's, that's everything. That's the rules and regulations that we face.